So welcome everybody. We will give everybody a minute to join us and then we will start. We have prepared many interesting insights for you today, so I'm burning to start. Hey. Hello everybody and a warm welcome to everybody who has joined. Please make sure that your microphones are muted. We're going to be quite a big group of people here today. And we are giving everybody a moment to join and then we'll start. In the meanwhile, you might want to say hello to everybody in the chat, um, maybe your names and from where you're joining us. Um, we've seen in the registrations that we have some people outside, even outside of, of uh, Switzerland and outside of Europe. So it would be nice to, to see um, where you're um, joining us from. So Netherlands, Scotland, for sure we have some people from Switzerland, yes, Lucerne, thank you Lucerne, <laughs> Switzerland, yeah. Finland, Zurich, great. Sorry, where's the, where's the chat function? <laughs> so at the, can I type? at the bottom of, of your screen you have an icon which is, uh, which says a chat actually, so you should see it. Don't. Okay, and I see we have um, hundred and over 170 people uh, who has joined us. Um, everybody saying hello. So a warm hello and welcome also from my side. My name is Alkistis Petropaki and I'm the general manager of Advance. And I will be moderating this event uh, today, looking very much forward to it. Before jumping into the content, uh, some, some housekeeping, P please make sure that you keep your mics um, muted. Um, as I said before, we're going to be quite a big group on this webinar today, and um, you can decide if you want to keep your cameras on um, or off. You can use the chat if you want to ask uh, any questions. So we're going to have breaks in the flow of the event to give you the opportunity to ask questions. And if you want to ask um, a difficult question, because the topic is, is a, a personal one, then you can always rename yourself with something like participant or anonymous or whatever you want, uh, if you don't want us um, the, the whole group to see the name your name. Okay, before we jump into the into the content, I would like to, to um, say a word about advance for those uh, who don't know the organization uh, yet. So um, advance is a non profit organization that has the mission to increase the percentage of women in management in Switzerland. And we are not doing this because of any philanthropic reasons towards women, but because we know a gender a diverse business world is a better one for everybody, for men, for women, and for business, and for society at large. The way we work is that we have companies as our members, and we are offering them a, a concrete program to help them reach their uh, diversity objectives. And Advance Today has uh, over 120 member companies uh, representing 500,000 employees in Switzerland, which is 10% uh, of the Swiss workforce. Now, the program that Advance is offering uh, to its member companies has four pillars. And what we are doing today is what we call Connect at Advance, which um, are events that bring def uh, different target groups from our member companies uh, together in order to um, hear insights or um, uh, see role models, et cetera, et cetera. So different types of ta target groups um, together. You can have a look of our complete program on our website, weadvance.ch. 
um, and um, a lot of other information, more details about the organization, if you're uh, interested in, in, in learning more about ADVANCE. Now, our event today has the title Performing Under Pressure. And what is very special about this is that we are going to hear a lot about Formula One um, as well. Um, so the, the event is organized in cooperation with Hinsa Performance. Hinsa is a coaching company supporting top athletes uh, like, like Formula One drivers, but also business professionals to reach a sustainable high performance. And I'm really, really happy to welcome our two speakers um, uh, today. Um, so Nora and Claudia. Nora Rosendahl is the COO, the Chief Operations uh, Officer of Hinza. She is interested in trends uh, in the workplace and in the same time, this is really uh, amazing, she's doing a, a doctoral dissertation on the future of, of knowledge work. Um, Nora has written several articles um, which have been published, uh, for instance, in the Financial Times or in, in McKinsey, McKinsey uh, Quarterly. Uh, but your true passion, Nora, is also writing, right? And um, you told us that, that um, one day, maybe you are going to be alone in a nice ca cabin by the sea and, and write a novel. So um, I'll, I'll come to join you for this one. And then I would like to uh, welcome Claudia Oken, um, as well. Claudia is the, he um, the head of Central uh, Europe at Hinsa. So she is a strategic advisor for executives um, on the business case for well being in organizations. Your passion, Claudia, is holistic well being and how to achieve change in behaviors that is, uh, is sustainable. Um, outdoor sports and especially sports in the mountains um, are uh, Claudia's source of energy. Um, as a child, she, she was compete, competing in ski races, but today, and this is very, really interesting, you prefer to run up the mountain, right? On skis or on bike or um, in, in climbing tours. So welcome both. I'm very, very much looking forward to have a discussion with you. Now, before we start the discussion, I would like to launch a poll. So and have our audience um, telling us um, in two words, how have you been feeling over the past week? So please choose two words um, from the poll um, and we can launch the poll now. So the words are inspired, tired, happy, stressed or overwhelmed, low on energy, hopeful, anxious, positive, exhausted, excited. So let's see how you were feeling over the past week and please choose two words. Well, we, ha we have a small problem with the polling. Uh, it is inactive at the moment from my device. Uh, can we do that? That's in okay, the I, I lost it. Um, okay. Okay. So the, the polling is, is working. I see okay, answers. Because so I see, I see um, yeah, almost 100 people that have answered. And yeah, well, this is very interesting. Um, so we have. I think we have now around 70, 75% who have uh, voted. So if we close it in a few seconds, three, two, one. They're the last ones. So, and guess what is then the uh, uh, answer number one? Tired. I can relate to this very, very much. So with a second being uh, probably stress or stress or overwhelmed. What is the first positive um, answer? Well, positive, right? At least we have some people that are positive as well, but tired and stressed, overwhelmed are our top two um, answers. And let's keep this information for the discussion afterwards. 
So I would like to start our discussion with Formula One, actually. So Nora, you are working with Formula One drivers, but also with business people. So tell us, why is the Formula One uh, driver coaching that you're doing relevant for business? That's a great question. The one that our clients often ask, you know, why is Formula One relevant? And Formula One is really an interesting sport in the sense that it has both immense physical and cognitive demands. Um, one of the Formula drivers said that it's almost like playing chess while running a marathon and doing that every single week. Um, so on the, the physical side, you know, in a race, obviously the driver's heart rate is really high. It's at 70 to 80% at, of max for hours. Um, but what's really interesting there is that it really requires a lot of cognitively demanding skills. Like an F1 driver uh, wheel has 35 different buttons and they're sharing that track with 19 other drivers and every corner that they come into can become their death or someone else's death or injury. So they really need to make fast decisions. There is no margin for error and cognitively that's really challenging work. But what really makes the difference um, is really the nature of sustained performance. So Formula One drivers, they need to stay at the top level cognitively and physically all the time because they have a season that spans 10 months. They do 21 race weekends. They do testing weekends. They race on five different continents. And all of that really adds up to, to quite a lot of demands. So um, Dr. Hintza, who is our was our founder, he was working as the trackside doctor in Formula One. And he also had a clinic in Switzerland. And he would get all of these business people who would come in feeling fatigued and overwhelmed. And he figured out that their lifestyle was really cognitively demanding work, high pressure to perform, constant traveling, little time or focus on sleep, exercise, things like that. So he figured, can I use the same model that I use for my Formula One clients also for business people? And that really did work and the, the stories are resonated. So that's the track that we're on. Okay, uh, this resonates with me very, very much. I mean, presenting the budget to the, to the CEO of the company can mean your death as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> very similar experiences. So Claudia, um, the, um, what are the key factors for um, a, a Formula One driver to win the race? Well, actually, very good question, because I just spoke about this with my management colleague, Pete McKnight, which is our sports coach director. And both Formula One drivers and their team members, they need to get first the fundamentals right. So physical exercise and uh, good recovery. That is sort of the hygiene level. And as a driver, you need to go between high quality training and uh, high quality recovery to develop. If you do that really well, well you, um, you get uh, to drive in a Formula One car. But to win, that's really a different story. And that comes down to um, the mental strengths. Um, so imagine a race day. The driver is under immense pressure to deliver. But if they take too many risks, they may lose, they cause injury, or they even, they die. But also the Formula One team members face a big performance challenge. Um, and the Formula One driver is actually highly dependent on his team. So on the one hand, constant maintenance of the car, and then on the race days, highest concentration, peak performance, and also high pressure to deliver well. And if they make mistakes, that can cost the driver the race. Mm -hmm. um, to deal with this stress, actually, our coaches work on the ability to perform under pressure, putting mistakes behind and um, minimizing fatigue. And uh, how do they do this? Uh, Pete mentioned uh, the concept of putting the focus on the process and not on the end result in times of um, highest tension. That uh, may sound a bit illogical at first, but actually it's not. Because 
everyone is aware of what the end result should be. For example, a tire change in a second or fastest lap time or winning the race. Um, but the decisive factor for success is not the outcome. You cannot control the outcome. You can only control yourself. Um, being in the moment and um, delivering at your best. And then he also said um, they do work along three areas. One is attitude, one is behavior, and one is mindset. So attitude means that um, being convinced that you are good at something and that you use these skills at the right time. Behavior is all about um, sticking to agreed rules on what you need to perform at your best. For example, no digital uh, device one hour before the race. And, um, and these rules, they actually need to be chosen by you, neither by um, the other team members or the driver, really by yourself. And then finally, the mindset. Um, it is important that you turn your anxiety, anger, anger um, or, or worrying into, into something positive because my negative mindset, that leads to a loss of control. Yeah, positive mindset. I can't imagine how important this is. Um, so to you, Nora, um, you mentioned um, just before that Kinza was um, founded by a medical doctor. Right. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Hinsa history, how, how you ended up in the Formula One world and business in the same time, etc.? Yeah, sure. So um, Hinsa Performance was founded by Dr. Aki Hinsa already back in uh, the 1990s. Um, he was an orthopedic surgeon and back in the 90s, he actually worked for a while in Africa, where he mostly worked as a missionary doctor with people from poor backgrounds. But because his spe specialty was in orthopedics, he also worked with long distance runners. For example, Heilige Brasilassia was one of his close friends and also his clients. And there he sort of started developing this holistic model of health and well being, which consists of seven different elements that we call the circle of better life. Now, since he was in orthopedics, he worked quite a lot with many other athletes as well. And that's why he was also then asked to be the trackside doctor in Formula One. So he would, you know, travel around with the teams and the drivers to all of the different races um, and take care of them. The interesting thing sort of spin with uh, Dr. Hintz's method was that his value proposition was slightly different from other doctors. He sort of told the drivers that I will not just help you win on the track. I will help you win off the track as well. I will look at you as an entire human being and that will make you more successful. And in the beginning, people were a bit like, what, what does that even mean? And what's, you know, holistic well-being? Uh, this was, you know, 20 years ago. So it, it wasn't that clear that, you know, how your mind works and your nutrition and your exercise, those are linked together. Uh, but it really, you know, became a big success and soon almost all of the drivers and the teams wanted to work with Dr. Aki. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And you mentioned the circle of better life. So can you tell us a little bit more about, about this? Yeah, so exactly. The, the model, the circle of better life has seven different uh, components. Um, so it includes general health, which is your serve, um, well, your overall state of health and the absence of illnesses. Then there is also physical activity, nutrition, sleep and recovery, uh, biomechanics, which is different from physical activity. <laughs> biomechanics is how your body really works and you're free from back pain or wrist pain and things like that. And then there is mental energy, your thoughts, emotions, etc., And then in the middle, there is what we call the core, uh, which is your identity and your pur purpose. So that's the, the sort of circle of better life that we, um, that we work with both athletes and business people with. And I think uh, prior to this event, we actually ran this survey to people who attended this as well. I think we had around 50 answers 
Uh, let me share my screen and we can look at what those answers were. Uh, Claudia, you had a look at these, right? Sorry, I was on mute. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, yes. You see on that screen the different parts of the better life, uh, circle of better life. And um, first of all, I saw that compared to other internal benchmark figures we have, your status of well being is not worse, but also not better. So when you see the ones in green are actually pretty good and the ones in yellow are those where you should have a look into it, which is physical activity, nutrition, uh, recovery and uh, mental energy. Um, when I looked into the more details, um, we saw that remarkably, uh, remarkably that about 50% of you have uh, a high life enjoyment, that's great in COVID times, but only 30% high work performance. And regarding the core, which is your purpose uh, in life, your identity and how much you are in control of it, um, that seems to be great among you because uh, almost 80% have said that they have a system of values and beliefs in place that guide their daily activities. But on the other hand, less than 50% stated that they have found a really significant meaning in their life. Then also uh, remarkable that um, uh, only a one, a one out of three said that they um, uh, don't do, do any strength training and almost 20% no flexibility training. Also, half of you disagreed that um, you get sufficient uh, daily sleep and recovery and also similar results regarding being able to relax during the work break. And finally, 60% um, said that uh, their mental energy level is good, but only one third agreed, for example, that they are able to focus on their work and avoiding distractions. And when I was looking through it, I was thinking as a rhetorical question, looking at the results, I, I was wondering um, what your reaction would be if these results were from your own teams in your, uh, in your companies. Ending over to Alkistis. Yes, thank you very much, Claudia. So we have a question in the chat asking where this data come from. And um, I would like to inform everybody that, um, that you had the opportunity um, with the registration to the event to participate in the survey if you wanted. So those are the answers that we got from the people that registered to the event. Okay, um, uh, that was really interesting. And we have already a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and I would like to remind everybody, if you have questions during the whole event, you can put them in the chat. And then in the breaks for questions that we will be doing, we will uh, try to answer as many as possible. So maybe we can take um, the first question that came in, which is, um, um, about uh, hypnosis, a very specific meditation and hypnosis, a very specific question. So the question is for mindset, do you use some kind of meditation or hypnosis? And if yes, do you use it for performance boost, for forgetting mistakes, for releasing stress? So I don't know who, Nora, maybe you want yeah. to go? Yeah, yeah. So that would probably for us go under mental energy or releasing stress or, or things like that. Um, I have not heard us use hypnosis. Um, I think the science is a bit fluffy on that one. Um, meditation, however, and breathing exercises is something we, we do do with our clients. And we have some coaches who are specialized in those techniques. Um, it's not always that every coach would do, you know, pick meditation. And it's definitely not for everyone either. Um, there is some science around you know, meditation actually in some cases being harmful for people. It can lead to overthinking, depression, things like that. So in every case, our coach always looks at that individual as a whole and to determine what would be good for them in their life situation. Okay, interesting. Thank you. 
Um, I would propose to move on to the next um, to the next um, part of of our event, which is talking about the recipe for well being, and this is a very interesting part because and a very positive one because yes, there is a recipe for well being, and um, Nora, I would like to give you the word to to, to take us through the recipe for well being, and again after uh, Nora's presentation. Um, we'll have again a break to answer a question. So if you want to uh, uh, ask any questions, please use the chat for this. And Nora, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alkistis. So indeed, I mean, there are many things that we could talk about when it comes to holistic well-being, but today we'll focus on just one. And since the topic was performing under pressure, we'll focus on how do you perform sustainably for the long term? And we call it the recipe of sustainable high performance. Now, to start off a disclaimer, uh, I know what you're thinking. All the well-being companies say the same thing. You know, just work less or give up on the idea of performance or eat salad, walk 10,000 steps, or you have to meditate or whatever it is. Well, we will do or say none of those things. Some of these tips here may be relevant for you. Some of them may be not. Today, we'll focus a bit more on the bigger picture, so the, the principle around performance that everyone should know. But let me start with something personal, uh, and I'll share my stress story, in a sense. This happened about 10 years ago, when suddenly I had a blackout. I was wide awake, but I had no idea where I was. And when I looked around, I realized that I was sitting in a taxi, I was abroad, outside the hotel and the driver had turned around and was asking, miss, where are we going? And I had really no idea where I was, where I was going, why. And that was when I realized that how I had been living and working up until that point was not normal. Now, why did this happen? I was back at, uh, in these times, I was a few years into my career in management consulting and I really loved the work, the projects, the people, the travel, uh, but I also had this sort of sense or need to prove myself. I was young, straight out of school. I was often the only woman in the room and I ended up just working way too much, about 80 hours per week. And I ended up exhausted, but I realized it in time and that moment in the taxi was one of them. So I really started making some changes to how I worked, how I uh, behaved outside of work as well. Nothing really big. It was more of like small changes, having lunch outside the office, not taking my phone with me to bed that night, nothing huge, but it worked. And I actually ended up dropping my working hours from about 80 down to about 60 in, in a few months. But that was not really interesting, the change in itself. What made it interesting was that I did not tell anyone that I was working less. To everyone else, I kept pretending that I still worked 80 hours a week. I, served, I faked a high workload because it was easier for me to fake it than to admit that I couldn't keep working at the same pace. I did not want anyone else to see me as weak. And I think that says a lot about, not only about how I thought, but about what we idealize in the workplace. Now, this happened 10 years ago, but it may as well have happened last week. Uh, I think like we saw in the beginning, many of us are feeling stressed, tired, and it's really all around us. And overall, we tend to respond in three different ways. The first one is that we work harder. We put in more hours and we press on. This has actually been really evident during COVID as well. In a Harvard study, they monitored 600 knowledge workers and they noted that even though people saved time from travel and commutes and all of that, they actually increased their work days by 10 to 20%. As a result, we're quite tired right now. The second pitfall that we fall into is that we start neglecting our physical needs. This is actually a textbook example from the 12 stages of burnout, 
where in stage three, we start neglecting our needs. So you're thinking, I can sleep one hour less, or I'll go to the gym next week. And what happens next is actually even more interesting because we start revising our values. We think, well, work is actually my number one focus right now, or you know, my hobbies are not that interesting or important to me anyways. And it sort of feels sensible in the moment, but it actually ends up making the stress worse. And then the third pitfall that we do is when someone asks, we say, I'm fine. We deny that there's a problem and we put up a brave face. This is especially problematic for people who have high drive and ambition. Our Formula One drivers, executives, you know, just driven business professionals. Like Srini Play of Harvard here says, he says that that strength where you can sort of focus on your work really ends up being a weakness because it helps us push through. And then, you know, like me, you may end up feeling blacked out in a cab. So why do we respond like this? It is the same reason really that I fake the 80 hour work week. We believe that it's stress is a sign of weakness that we can't take it. Well, it's not a sign of weakness. Stress is actually completely normal. And if we go back actually to the definition of stress, what happens physiologically when we're put under pressure is that we're exposed to a stressor and our body and mind reacts. That's our sympathetic nervous system. Then after that, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and we get sort of down from that stress high and back to our baseline. That's a normal stress response. But what happens in a, a, an abnormal stress response is that we react to a stressor, but we can't sort of shut that system down and we don't get back to the baseline. We start accumulating the effects of stress and it becomes chronic stress. Interestingly, this is actually what, what separates humans from animals. Um, if you've ever seen, for example, an antelope, uh, run away from a lion in the nature documentary, right? That's a very stressful situation for the antelope. But what happens if we say that, that if the lion gives up the chase and the antelope goes, you know, is, is out of the stressful situation, what they sort of do is that they do this shaking motion almost, and then they forget it. They go back to eating grass. So they do this uh, naturally, uh, while we as humans, we're, we have the ability to think, and that makes it possible for us to stay in that stress state. You know, we keep analyzing, why did that happen? Why did he say that? Why did my boss react that way? Why did the client not do that? And we're a bit too smart for ourselves, and that's why we end up in this chronic stress state. And this is actually what athletes like Formula One drivers have become good at creating that upward and downward motion of stress and recovery. And you can almost um, see it as a car analogy. And since we work a lot with uh, Formula One drivers, we often use this. You know, um, just like in a car, you have that accelerator or the gas pedal, which is the stress reaction. It allows us to go fast and to accelerate into a difficult situation, you know, be it with a client or with a boss or on a tough project. But sooner or later, you know, with a car, you need to do the straight road will curve and you need to turn the steering wheel. And that's when we need the brake, which is our parasympathetic nervous system. And that's when we need that to kick in. And while this is true for physical activity, it's also actually true for mental work. So this is a bit of a, a uh, science-y, geeky slide, but bear with me for a moment. Um, so at Hintza, we are involved in a large research project with, with Alta University, where we're following over 3,000 knowledge workers over multiple years. And we measure them on 500 different drivers related to well being and a good workplace. What you're looking at here is something called a structural equation model. So, how that works is that you put in all of the data of those 3,000 people 
And then you try to optimize for good outcomes and see what really drives good results. And here, what we've been optimizing for is three things, high engagement, high thriving, so learning and the sense of energy that you have at work, and then low burnout rates. Now, I could talk about these arrows and stars and, uh, and numbers all day, but what you really need to know is this. Um, all of these relationships are statistically relevant and significant. And secondly, what you see there, the four brown boxes are what we call main mediators. So when we at work feel meaning, autonomy, relatedness, and competence, that's when we get a workplace with low burnout, high thriving, high engagement. So we can, of course, improve our sense of meaning or autonomy separately, but we can also look at what drives that. So the main things us in, as individuals can do, the first thing is recover. When we get enough mental recovery, we boost our sense of meaningfulness, autonomy, etc. The second thing we can do is watch our working hours. And this is an interesting one because it behaves paradoxically. In the short term, you can see that there is that green arrow going from working hours to all of the brown boxes. So when we work more, we boost our sense of meaning and autonomy and we get this feeling of productivity. However, that's a bit deceptive. It's almost like a drug because there's also that red arrow going from working hours to mental recovery. The more we work, the less we recover. So, and we don't even notice that, that we recover less and our performance sort of plummets. So all of this to say uh, or reveal the recipe of sustainable high performance as easy as possible is experiencing that state of positive stress, which in research terms is often called being focused and engaged, and then following that up with rest. And then figuring out how you sort of switch between those two modes. Now, I did not personally make this up. Um, Andrew Huberman is a neuroscientist and researcher at Stanford. And he says that our brain is able to do many different modes, obviously. But if you want to crack high performance, this is it. If you can figure out these two states and toggle between them, then you will both perform well and be well. So this is the, the one picture that I hope you remember from, from this talk. Now, so what does that rest state mean? Um, so rest is sleep, rest is workday recovery and post workday recovery, and then also longer term recovery. So with clients, we often start to talk about how you start and end the workday, how you uh, do sort of a Monday warm up and the Friday cool down um, and, and pace the work here, etc. So if we go into something concrete, um, I'd say we often talk about that element of mental recovery um, and people often think, well, that's just one thing. Well, actually in research terms, it is four different things. Um, the first part is relaxation, which sort of comes naturally to many of us. We think, you know, after a tough work day, I'll, you know, watch Netflix on the sofa or I'll go to the spa or something like that. And that's fine, but that's very passive recovery, right? So what our brain actually needs is something a bit more intellectually stimulating. And that's the mastery part of it. So if you are like me at some point, crashed on the couch uh, to watch Netflix after work, actually try to think about what is something more intellectually stimulating that you could do. For example, uh, there's a picture of a jigsaw puzzle there. That's my uncool hobby, uh, 2000 piece jigsaw puzzles. I have clients who say, oh, I got into model airplanes or I picked out my guitar again and started playing. Um, and at some point, you know, I used, we used to play chess with my husband in the evening. Um, so we canceled Netflix and, and, and played chess instead. He started getting too good though. So uh, to save our marriage, 
uh, and to keep me on a winning streak. Uh, we've, we've dropped that now. Um, the third element is detachment, uh, which is really your mind's ability to let go of work in your free time. Um, there a concrete tip um, that I do when I get back home from work is that I have this micro moment where I pause when I put my key inside the door to, to go back home. Um, and I ask myself, who is the person that I want to be behind that door, right? I have two small kids, they're five and two years old. So I think, do I want to be that stressed and frazzled mother or do I actually want to be present for dinner and bedtime? So that's detachment. And then control is simply feeling like you are um, in control and doing things that you want to spend your free time on. And here during COVID, actually, we had this experience with our Formula One clients where they said, wow, this is actually the first time in my life during COVID lockdowns where I can be more of a father than the Formula One driver. And that feeling of control and doing meaningful things with your free time is actually really important for, for our mental recovery. So go through your, you know, those four areas in your own mind and think, are you completing each of them uh, for your mental recovery to be, to be highly qualitative? But I'm gonna pause here and ask Alkestis if we have any quick questions um, or if we wanna go forward to the next part. Well, we have um, a, a very lively discussion in the chat. A lot of people were talking about rest and what is um, uh, real rest, but you've touched upon um, several things in, the, um, in your presentation already. Um, exactly. We had a question that I thought uh, was quite interesting when you were talking about your story. Uh, Nora, somebody, uh, Judith, asked um, how, what would have been an argument that would, you would have accepted from the outside world um, to, to really realize that you were right uh, just in front of a, a burnout? Because you can imagine, especially young people that are in their um, high achiever stage, Right, they wouldn't accept very, very easily that that they are actually very stressed. Yeah, and that that's a really good question. It really goes into the heart of how do we get people, how do we change that narrative around who is the superhero in the workplace, right? Because um, it was back then, and still is partly right now that the superhero is the one who you know, dedicates oneself to work and works the long hours, etc. I think. Um, I think it wasn't, wouldn't have been an argument um, per se, but perhaps more of a, in a sense, a coaching type question. You know, do you feel that what you're doing right now is sustainable? Can you keep that up for 10 years or even a year or even a month in some cases, right? So more about probing, you know, why are you doing that? And do you think that is smart would you recommend someone else to do it and when i became a project manager with people on my team i had to ask myself do i want to put them in that situation of working in that way or is there a better way mm -hmm. yeah very interesting okay let me take another question from from the chat so claudia is, is uh, saying she absolutely buys in the rest that is needed etc but everything becomes very tricky when you have children right? <laughs> do you have any advice here how to uh, show children that they need to respect our rest times <laughs> yes um and and you know i know that sleep deprivation that comes from from having small children i think um so there are good sides and bad sides to it right because I think that the, the element of sleep, et cetera, can be hurt uh, by having kids. And, you know, my kids coming up at 6 a.m. on a Saturday and saying, hey, I want to watch Paw Patrol is not great for me either. But that detachment side, I think, does benefit people with children. Because with kids, you sort of, you have to detach. 
you, you have to be present. You have a hard deadline to end the work. Um, and I think there, the key question for me is, you know, when you are present with your family or friends or kids, are you really present or are you sort of just going through the motions and solving the work stuff in your head? So how do you really, when you are present, can you really be present as well? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. We have uh, other comments, etc., in the in the chat, one of which is if the presentation will be going to be shared after the, the meeting. And I want to say to everybody that we, the meeting is actually recorded. So the link to the recording will be available. And obviously, you will have uh, in the same package the presentation as well. So let's move on because time is flying. Um, let's move to the next uh, to the next part of the meeting, um, which is um, about an organization and well-being in an organization. Because an organization is also a living a living organism, actually, um, and it's made up of, of 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 the people that are there. So Claudia, um, yeah, the floor is yours. Tell us a little bit about this interesting topic. Yeah, thank you, dear Akistis. And um, well, let me start with the fact that uh, the crux of well-being in an organizational context actually often starts with the term itself. Well-being has a somewhat ambiguous connot uh, connotation, I would say. It often creates the image and sometimes even the fear about employees who devote their working hours more to Dolce Vita than to their to-do lists. Less work and more life in this equation of work-life balance. We are currently, for example, working with an uh, international corporation where that was exactly the issue. They said to me, Claudia, look, our boss is not a fan of the word well-being. Um, can you replace it some uh, with something around sustainable performance? Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, when I was a banker and um, management consultant previously in my career, employee well-being was known to me primarily as um, occupational health management out of HR. And I particularly remember topics such as um, safely designed workplaces, recording of working hours, uh, break regulations, but also local um, running groups, canteen vouchers, health checkups uh, for those traveling, etc. And then actually the time of company-wide well-being initiatives started with fruit baskets in the office, uh, annual health day, step counting activities, uh, etc. But uh, also communication campaigns around the topic started. Do good and talk about it. However, one problem with such well-being programs was often that it mainly attracted those who were um, already focusing on their attention on a healthy lifestyle anyway. And uh, it was mostly around fitness and nutrition rather than workplace stress reduction or burnout and fatigue, mental toughness, cognitive skills, a lot of the things Nora mentioned. Um, and actually, even cynicism often came up among the employees. I heard quotes like, oh, great, another initiative. Now they want, to, uh, want us to eat more vegetables and uh, count steps so that they can squeeze the lemon even further. So I remember even from my uh, consulting days when I once left the office before 6 p.m., I got this nice comment, oh, Claudia, are you taking half a day off? Next slide, please. If we take a closer look at today's work, uh, world, and actually even before COVID already, um, we see an increase in complexity the modern knowledge worker has to deal with, or um, should I better say, struggle with. Because we see these drastic challenges due to digitalization, and human capital being a differentiating factor. Also information overload, constant ac uh, accessibility, changing demands of, um, of young and more diverse talents, lead, uh, leading to new leadership skills, as well as uh, effects due to high stress and um, 
hy uh, hybrid work. Um, nowadays, actually, leading well-being has become a business imperative of strategic importance. And we see more and more that high-performing leaders and employees who can deal with these challenges are a top priority in uh, forward-looking high-performing companies. But over the past few years, there has been also a shift in how to achieve this. This old traditional narrative that's all about excellence, high performance, um, results, intelligence, talent, and that well-being is uh, something completely personal that moves uh, towards, with, let's call it a softer and employee-centric elements, but actually all roots uh, are rooted in the science of human performance. And the trends we are seeing now with our clients are all about stress, burnout prevention, mental health support, changing the way of working, and um, really thinking about what drives learning and innovation, as well as a healthy culture. Could somebody please uh, put the microphone on mute? Thank you so much. <laughs> so I would say from well-being as a perk, actually, to well-being as a must. And yeah, COVID has accelerated much of this. And let's be honest, the high pressure to perform in this more complex and digital environment, that will remain. And we need to be aware of this. And we also have to uh, put coping strategies in place, both um, on the personal side, but also in the workplace. Which brings me to um, the next poll. I would like to invite you to participate. Um, I started by saying that the definition of the word uh, well-being is ambiguous. Um, so I would like to raise the poll and asking you, um, how do you define well-being? What does well-being means for you and why it is relevant for your organization? We have prepared a list of arguments, all backed up by research. Um, that could be things like managing costs, um, fighting mental health challenges, staying sharp and high performing, retaining top talents, attracting younger generation, enabling very important diversity and inclusion, keeping workface, uh, workforce safety, improving leadership, preparing for the future of work or um, being part of sustainability efforts. So if you a couple of seconds to think about that and then please put your answer in the chat. I would say maybe choose two of these which are most relevant for you. Yeah, people are, the, the answers are coming in. So we um, will give it a few more seconds. Um, all right. Most people have answered now, so I will close it in three, two, one. There we go. Sharing the results. What comes out at top is staying sharp and high performing, definitely, but also this fighting mental health challenges, um, definitely. Um, I think this is what we're seeing with our clients as well. It's both the, the upside, right? How can we get more of you know, more sharp minds, but also how can we make sure that that downside doesn't happen, that people are not burning out? Um, and since Advance works with diversity and inclusion, uh, this is actually something that many of our clients say that they need well-being in able to um, make the, the, the playing field more level for minority groups. Uh, be them, you know, working parents or women or other minorities, that they, that the diversity and inclusion and well-being often can go even hand in hand in, in many cases. Yeah, very good points. And also, um, for me, important, I see these many different, um, di uh, different answers. And um, this shows to me that it is important to set a clear baseline and, and get a joint understanding when talking about leading in well-being, uh, leading well-being in the organization. So what do we really want to achieve with, uh, with this? And we thought uh, we would like to share a few 
key success factors for leading well-being in the workplace. And um, our experience from working with corporate clients and also from uh, the learnings in Formula One, some we highlighted a bit earlier, show actually five uh, success factors. So first of all, mindset change at the top. The senior leaders, they need to change their mindset about well-being and actually the order of the equation. Um, as our founder, Dr. Aki Hinsa always said, success is a byproduct of well-being and not the other way around. And for us at Hinsa, there's also not really a work-life balance. Uh, it's only life and uh, that has to be in balance. Then the second topic is all organizational levels need to be involved. So on the corporate uh, uh, level side, um, promoting individual high performance is not eff effective if the corporate environment is not coherent. So organizations, they need to design directions, practices, structures that actually promote healthy behavior. Then the leaders level, only healthy leaders who are mindful of themselves they are also high performing leaders. And those who are under constant stress with sleep deficits, fatigue, time overload, they have demonstrably limited abilities to make good decisions um, and practice good leadership skills in the long run, actually. We shouldn't forget leaders' behavior is contagious. And then the first level, the employee level. You cannot outsource the res responsibility for your own well-being and performance to your employer completely or somebody else. So employees need to raise their voice. They need to support each other and they need to claim um, their needs to be able to perform at their best. Then the third topic is walk the talk. Well, um, even though I, as an ex-consultant, I do not really like this term, um, one of these overused buzzwords, but uh, actually it hits the mark because leaders need to role model, but in the right way. And better not talking as a leader about the importance of weekend rest and recovery while assigning tasks on a Friday to your team for uh, completion Monday morning, for example. And then fourth, um, sustainable Cultural and uh, behavioral change takes time. We all know that, uh, be it with the New Year's resolutions, for example. And it is also an iterative process. So um, don't position well being at the workplace just as another initiative. It doesn't work. Embed that really in the company DNA. And we actually um, propose different phases. So in the first phase, um, there you set the baseline, you initiate the mindset shift um, at the top and create also grassroots excitement at the bottom. Then the focus of a second phase should be on things like healthy leadership skills, working habits, um, but also, for example, accountability and monitoring. And then finally, reviewing, reinforcing, readjusting, deep dive um, into relative um, irrelevant topics to make the sustainable change really stick. And then last but not least, targeted interventions. So what for someone is a source uh, uh, of energy, so like for me, intensive outdoor sports, that might be for somebody else the way into a burnout. But taking everybody onto the health journey um, requires different support on different levels at different pace. In terms of performing under pressure, which is um, the topic uh, for, for today, um, we support our corporate clients along three dimensions. And I think we just lose the slides, or is it just me not seeing the slides? No, sorry. I think we're running out of time a bit, so okay. I, I stopped sharing. <laughs> ah, okay. So then I just finalize here quickly. <laughs> So we see a surviving mode where coping skills uh, is key, then performing mode, balancing good and bad stress and recovery, and then a real thriving mode where you want to reach peak cognitive performance, such as creativity. Good. 
Thank you. That was the clear sign, Nora, to stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, Claudia. It was so interesting. I think uh, I, I could listen to you for another hour, um, right? But the time is indeed uh, running. So we're coming to the end of the event. And I would like to close to e the event, um, which was extremely interesting, um, with um, asking both of you to give us one your the tip right that that um, everybody should take uh, with with them for um, sustainably uh, high performance. And before doing that, I would like to tell everybody that um, uh, there are there are some questions in the chat that we haven't been able to to answer. So I would like to propose to everybody to contact either um, uh, Nora or Claudia via LinkedIn and ask the questions there. Uh, you both said that you are happy, right, to answer uh, any question in LinkedIn. So Nora and Nora, maybe first, give us your one tip for sustainably high performance. Yeah, I, I would repeat that question of, you know, who is the person that you want to be? Um, and going into different situations, right? When you arrive at, for, at the workplace in the morning, who do you want to be that day for your colleagues, for your teammates? When you go into a new meeting, who do you want to be? And then when you go home again, re-ask that question because that helps you switch roles and do that detachment uh, much better. Okay. Thank you, Nora. Claudia? I will keep it um, really very, very short. So I think it is important that it's not only a wish and you close your eyes and then you think the change happens, but you really have a clear intention, um, a determination and action. So um, what do you really want to achieve? Um, think about it, visualize it and really have a plan to, um, to execute on it. Otherwise, uh, it's, uh, it will not work. So thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Nora, for all your insights. Um, the topic had so much interest that maybe we need to repeat right, this webinar somehow. Let's see in the future. I would like uh, to ask everybody to keep uh, to stay tuned on our website. You can find uh, events that are coming up. Um, so we're um, going to do a summer uh, break um, now. But in September, I would like to invite everybody to join us uh, for the um, a presentation of the gender intelligence report. So this is the report that uh, Advance is uh, publishing every year in cooperation with the um, uh, University of St. Gallen. And the big topic this year is going to be fix the system, not the women. And with this, uh, a very big thank you to our audience. It was great having you and wishing you everybody a great evening. Thank you very much and bye bye everybody. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Nice, nice evening. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Muchísimas gracias in the chat. So somebody is sending us thank you in, uh, in Spanish. That's nice. We still have some people joining. So I believe there are in the number.